So we now invite our brother, Donald, to give the talk entitled Stormy Wind Fulfilling God's Word. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this title, Stormy Wind Fulfilling His Word, is also a name of a book which probably many of you will be acquainted with, um, Brother Tony Benson, Benson sorry, um, uh, wrote this book a number of years ago and shortly before his death he re revised it and added quite a few more chapters so that uh, if you've got the old copy it is well worthwhile buying the new copy because there's a lot of additional material in that. So the, the phrase is taken from that reading that we had in Psalm 148 in the middle there. It talks about praising God from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps, fire, hail, snow and vapour, stormy wind fulfilling his word. And first of all, I just want us to run through this particular psalm and see how God calls upon all creatures and all things uh, in, in the world to praise God because of his great goodness. The series of psalms, let's just go back, the, the uh, last five psalms are what are called Hallel psalms uh, and these are all to do with praising God for his goodness. So this particular psalm, and uh, don't worry if you can't read the words, uh, it's just to get it all on one page as it were, but it's divided into sections. The first six verses tell us that praise comes even from the heavenly things that God has made. Uh, and then the next ver six verses tell us that praise comes from the earthly things that God has made. And uh, last of all, uh, his saints, those that follow him, should exalt and praise his glorious name. And so if we look at the detail of that psalm, just to magnify it a bit so we can read it, um, it, it tells us who should praise him. Praise ye him, all his angels, uh, all his hosts, and the sun and the moon render praise to God. We, we can't hear their voice, but in the way that they keep their orbits, as we shall see, they do render praise to one who has created them, uh, one who is a wonderful God. And he calls upon the heavens of heavens and the waters above the heavens to praise God. Let them all praise his name, for he commanded and forth they came. Uh, and finally, um, uh, he also established them for ever and ever. He made a decree that shall not pass. And we shall see that in many ways uh, the things that God has created have fixed laws that he has created which they keep. And we can marvel at the accuracy that man can predict the coming of uh, various movements of the heavens. Uh, we had back in June the transit of Venus, didn't we? Uh, and man was able to forecast exactly when it would begin and when it would end uh, as Venus uh, travelled um, just across the, the face of the sun. And just the very fact that when we have an eclipse of the sun and the moon, that although the moon is so much smaller than the sun, because it is that much nearer, it, it appears as if it is exactly the same size. So that when there is uh, an eclipse of the sun, the moon just exactly, exactly just fits the same size as the sun. Now, the, the scientists talk about that as uh, sheer chance that that happened. But this is part of praising God and seeing the design, the beauty in God's creation of, of the wonderful works that he has done. Wonderful craftsmanship. In the middle section, God looks for praise from the things that he has created upon the earth. Again, if we just enlarge that section, um, praise should come from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps. Um, that's where it's coming from and uh, it's fire and hail and snow and vapour all show the wonderful creation of God. 
and the mountains and the hills and the trees and the birds and the animals uh, and even man upon it should praise God because of his great goodness whether we're young or old rich or poor we should all praise God uh, and the reason is that God is alone he is the only one who has created everything and for his glory everything has been made and God's handiwork is literally everywhere it's in the glory of the mountains, the beauty and the shape of the mountains. It's in the beauty of a mouse, in the design of a mouse. We, we see wonderful uh, craftsmanship, making it uh, a, a complete creature, able to function, able to reproduce. Uh, if we look at the stars, we see God's handiwork. And if we look at stallions, we see God's handiwork, beauty and design and symmetry all speak to us of a wonderful creator all have a glory of their own and reflect glory to the one who has made them and in the previous psalm it, it uh, speaks of being able to see the glory of God wherever we look um, Psalm 147 opens with praise ye the Lord for it is good to sing praises unto our God for it is pleasant and praise is comely. Now, that's well, an old-fashioned word, but um, an old commentator put it this way. Praise is comely, it is decent, befitting and proper that every intelligent creature should acknowledge the supreme being as he does nothing but good to the children of men so that they should speak good of his name. Now, Brother Benson, in his book on Stormy Wind, relates how God uses the forces of nature to move his purpose onward. And again, uh, if we go back to one of the oldest books in the Bible, to the book of Job, we see that Job recognised this, uh, and there's uh, a great speech that is made. Behold, God is great, and we know him not. Also, can any understand the spreading of the clouds or the noise of his tabernacles? He goes on to say, Behold, he spreadeth his light upon it and covereth the bottom of the sea. For he judgeth them that are his people. He giveth meat in abundance. By the breath of God, frost is given and the breath of the water is straightened. And it is turned round by his counsels that they may do whatsoever he commandeth them upon the face of the whole of the world in the earth. And he goes on to say, he causeth to come, whether for correction, or for his land, or for mercy. So he's saying that God uses his powers and the things that he has made to move his purpose on, sometimes for punishment, sometimes for blessings, but God uses his world to further his purpose. And one of the minor prophets, Nahum, also speaks in the same way that God uses his power to further his plans. God is jealous, says Nahum, and revengeth. The Lord revengeth and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries. He reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt. The earth is burned at his presence, yea, the world and all that dwell therein. And he goes on to say, who can stand before his indignation? Who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. So let's look at some of the examples of where God uses the forces of nature to control his plan and his purpose. 
And of course, in the time of the flood was one of the biggest outpourings of God's judgment upon the world when the whole world of Noah's day was wiped out apart from Noah and his family. I remember how Noah and his family had to build an ark and take the animals on uh, in order to escape the destruction. And God tells us that uh, at the time of the flood that the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. So what does it mean by the fountains of the great deep being broken up? Well, we know at creation that God put into the earth abundant water supplies. And even today, there's a lot of water under the earth and uh, many fountains and springs come up. But in the time of the flood, there was uh, absolutely uh, catastrophic um, breaking open of uh, valleys in the seas and uh, volcanic action which caused waters and volcanic action to come up from the earth uh, and bring waters to the surface which uh, were under the earth. And uh, that water and the effects of that water um, change the whole appearance of the earth. It's, it's very interesting that today when we look at the rocks of the earth about 10% of the earth's rocks are what are called sedimentary which have been laid down by water. The other 90% are volcanic. But the actual rocks around the surface of the earth 75% of those are sedimentary and the rest are where the underlying uh, volcanic action has uh, come to the surface. So on the surface of the earth we have this uh, sedimentary water laid strata uh, and I believe that this is uh, what happened in the time of the flood with the waters coming from beneath the earth and tidal waves around the earth uh, laid down all these strata. <laughs> And that's why we, when we look at the rocks, they're nearly all nice and neatly laying one upon another because they were laid down in the time of the flood. And, you know, go to Hunstanton, lots of people see these uh, cliff strata at Hunstanton and they're layer upon layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And no appearance, the upper geologists will say, well, those were laid down over millions of years. But we believe that at uh, the time of the flood, these things were laid down. That's why we get uh, tree trunks which run through many, many strata. But that's, that's uh, a bit aside. So as well as the fountains of water underneath the earth coming up in the time of the flood, God tells us he uses the water that was above the earth. Now, we have clouds around the earth, but um, at creation, God we're told uh, in Genesis chapter 1, put water out into space, um, a, a thick layer of water which would still allow the sun through it, it would be water vapour, but uh, was a considerable amount of water, and it was these uh, fountains of heaven, the windows of heaven, sorry, which uh, broke up uh, at the time of the flood, which brought down the 40 days and 40 nights of catastrophic um, rain. God also used the forces of nature in his punishment of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, this is a picture where we believe that uh, Sodom is. This is looking from the Jordanian side across to the mountains of Israel, and that's the Jordan Valley. And this is from Mount Nebo looking across. And in that area there are this, the remains of what we believe is the city of Sodom. It was a considerable city, it was the chief city in the area at the time um, of uh, Abraham. Uh, so another 500, 600 years after the time of the flood. And uh, the archaeologists have discovered many things, the city and the wall around the city and the gateway where the, in the Bible told that a uh, lot sat in the gate of the city. But we find evidence of tremendous destruction, uh, a deep layer, uh, uh, a metre thick of ash uh, that uh, indicates to us there's life underneath, a thick layer of ash, 
uh, and then the, the city wall um, it has been rebuilt above this ash, showing there was a period in the history of Sodom when it was violently covered in a thick layer of ash. And in that layer of ash, we have uh, human remains which uh, express a terrible catastrophe. They're not just neatly been laid in a grave. The bones have been ripped and torn and shredded um, and broken and scattered, indicating there was some tremendous catastrophe. Uh, and any bricks beneath this uh, layer have been absolutely baked to a very high temperature. They're, they're so hard, it's as if they've been baked uh, to a temperature of about 6,000 degrees, something you know, far beyond anything normal in brick making. And even the pottery that belongs to that period has been so heated that it's uh, very comparable to what one finds where there's been nuclear explosion and nuclear testing grounds where the intense heat of, of the nuclear explosion takes the rocks and melts them uh, and makes them very hard. So it, it points to some terrible um, judgment of God upon the city of Sodom as spoken of by God. If we move on to the time of the Exodus, uh, there were ten plagues, and in many of them God uses the forces of nature. Certainly in the fourth one, the bringing of flies, uh, we're, not, we're not specifically told God used the force of nature, but no doubt, as in later ones, the wind was, uh, would bring the flies in uh, and would carry them away. We certainly know in the seventh plague was a plague of hail, and that again was under the control of God. Terrible, devastating hail came just at that time. Uh, and the eighth plague of the locusts was specifically told about the wind coming along and bringing the locusts in, and again doing tremendous damage to anything that the hail had uh, left. Um, so uh, great destructions. And the ninth was darkness, so again God controlled, there was no sunlight, thick darkness uh, over Egypt, but where the, the portion of uh, Egypt where Israel dwelt, they had light in their dwelling. So again, God was using in some wonderful way uh, the forces of nature to bring about darkness, thick clouds, sandstorm, whatever, over uh, the Egyptian area, whereas uh, over his people it was clear. Yeah. We know how God used wind when the children of Israel came to cross the Red Sea. Very strong wind drove the sea apart and the sea was, it were, frozen on either side until the children of Israel had gone through and then they came crashing down over the Egyptians who were pursuing them. And again, there's an incident of God supplying them with quails to eat and again, specifically told that the wind blew them in. Uh, to the encampment of Israel. And when the children of Israel conquered the land, there are several incidents we read there of uh, God using uh, forces of nature when in time of Joshua there were great hailstones which uh, came to pass, uh, Joshua 10 verse 11 says, it came to pass as they fled before Israel and were in the going down to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Ezekiel, and they died. And they were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with a sword. And we know how devastating huge hailstones can be, as uh, our doorkeeper will witness. <laughs> um, so, yes, they can kill you if they're really a big size and come down. And another incident is when God used hornets, uh, very vicious little uh, creatures. Um, it was uh, just a few years ago, a, a plague of hornets in uh, France. And this was a headline from the Telegraph. Tourists warned as Asian hornets terrorise French. Very vicious. Um, and so God used these creatures to uh, get rid of the inhabitants of the land. There are other uh, examples later on in the time of the judges, uh, in the time of uh, Sisera who had invaded Israel 
Uh, he had great iron chariots, but God caused it to rain heavily, and again great hailstones, so that they were killed and the chariots were bogged down. So just at a specific time, God uses his powers to direct the forces of nature to forward his purpose. And uh, we read that Jehoshaphat, he had built a ship, a fleet of ships, uh, and uh, that wasn't the right thing to have done, and, and God sent a storm and they were all broken. And we remember in the time of Jonah, he was caught up in a great storm, wasn't he? And they thought the ship was going to sink, and Jonah confessed, well, this storm has come because I'm running away from my God. We think of Jesus in Galilee on several occasions. Storms on the Sea of Galilee and his disciples very frightened. And Jesus was able just to say, peace, be still. And the storm immediately ceased. We think of the Apostle Paul, shipwrecked many times. And we have that great description at the end of the book of Acts of that shipwreck that took them for 14 days around the Mediterranean before they were um, thrown upon the uh, island of uh, Malta. So many times God uses his stormy winds. And looking at history, one can see certain events which were very much governed by the forces of nature and they turned the uh, outcome of, of an important part in the Earth's history, turning points. We read in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 11 of uh, how the Medo-Persian Empire would come to an end at the hands of the Grecians. Now the Medo-Persians thought they were very strong and they built a, a fleet of ships to go and to um, conquer the Greeks but that wasn't God's plan and purpose God had clearly foretold that the time would come for the Medo-Persian Empire to come to an end and the Grecian Empire to be the, the one that would rise but uh, uh, Xerxes had built a big fleet to go to sail to Greece but they hadn't set off long when a huge storm wrecked that fleet it was about another 11 years before he was able to build another fleet, a bigger fleet this time, on 1,320 ships compared with his uh, 370. But again, a terrific storm came. He lost 400 of those ships. And then when he did get to uh, <laughs> Greece, there was violent rain and thunder which caused absolute panic to the sailors. Uh, and Herodotus uh, makes this comment, he says, Heaven was indeed doing everything possible to reduce the superiority of the Persian fleet and bring it down to the side of the Greek. They met in uh, 481 at the Battle of Salamis and uh, Xerxes could only watch as his ships were defeated and there was a great earthquake which uh, added to the confusion and the Greeks overcame the Persian boats and the power of Greece of, uh, of uh, Persia was broken uh, and Greece came to the fore. And so one can see as one reads through the history of the times that it was the forces of nature under God's control that caused that turning point, um, giving victory to the Greeks and not to the Persians. <coughs> Again, God uses the forces of nature, used the forces of nature in the events leading to AD 70, which was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman armies. And in the Mount Olivet prophecy, Jesus made it quite clear to his disciples that God was going to use the forces of nature against his own people because of their wickedness. They were, uh, the Mount Olivet prophecy was given just prior to the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and God was going to punish his people for their rejection of the Messiah. And in that Mount uh, Olivet prophecy, uh, Jesus foretold that the wonderful temple, which the disciples admired with its great stones and that, he said, the day is going to come when there will be not one stone left upon another that shall not be thrown down. And the disciples were absolutely shocked by that. 
but Jesus' words were fulfilled. The, the foundations still remain, but the, the buildings above the foundations were thrown down. The buildings, as he says, were thrown down. And uh, Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who lived through this period and witnessed what happened, so thoroughly levelled and dug up that no one visiting the city would believe it had ever been inhabited. Absolutely destroyed was uh, Jerusalem in AD 70. Now, Jesus had given them signs. Um, some of them were of persecution, but others were of natural events. Uh, seemingly natural events, let's put it like that, they were under God's control, but and God promised them that there would be famines and earthquakes. Uh, well, that was the third sign. The fourth sign was that there would be fearful sights and signs. And in fact, as we read through the Acts of the Apostles, we do read of some of these um, difficult times. Uh, there was a famine foretold by Agabus in Acts chapter 11, which is mentioned by various... Uh, writers which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar and was so severe at Jerusalem that Josephus says many died for lack of food. Pestilences are the usual attendants of famines as the scarcity and badness of provisions generally produced epidemic disorders. So uh, Jesus said there would be famines. We have records outside the Bible and as well as within the Bible of saying that there were famines uh, and there were these pestilences. And as for fearful sights, Tacitus, who was uh, a Roman uh, historian, records that in the year 50, AD 51, um, in Rome, this year witnessed many prodigies, signs or omens, including repeated earthquakes. And Josephus himself uh, records an earthquake in Judea was of such a magnitude that the constitution of the universe was confounded for the destruction of men. He also wrote that earthquakes were a common calamity in his day. And he mentions earthquakes in various places, in Crete and Smyrna, Miletus and Chios and Samos and Laodicea and Hierapolis and Colossae, uh, Campania, which is in Italy and Rome and in Judea. So Jesus has said these would happen uh, and uh, we know from external evidence that these did indeed come to pass. Josephus records also that these uh, earthquakes, were, well the one in Judea, sorry, the one in Judea, accompanied by a dreadful tempest, violent winds, vehement showers and continually lightnings and thunders which led many to believe that these things portended some uncommon calamity. And a few years later, uh, Rome uh, came <coughs> with her, his armies uh, and Jerusalem fell. So it did portend an uncommon calamity. We also have turning points, I believe, uh, in the uh, destruction of the Spanish Armada. Um, King Philip of Spain was intent on taking Britain back to Catholicism and they set out with uh, a big uh, fleet of ships, 130 ships, but uh, they lost 67 of those ships, mainly in storms. Um, obviously the British did destroy some of them, but uh, half the ships were uh, lost. Uh, and Britain just lost five ships, which were fire ships, which she had deliberately set fire to and sailed into the Spanish fleet. So, uh, again, we're told uh, from a contemporary writer that the, that the year, the year of the 1588, was an exceptionally stormy year. Cyclone followed cyclone. You know, the kind of weather we've been having, but much worse. And so I believe that this was an occasion when God used his power to save Britain from being turned back into a Catholic country. And one can probably say with the Dunkirk evacuation and uh, Nelson's uh, victory at Trafalgar, the winds and the lack of winds played an important part. Now we know that when 
the Lord Jesus comes back, that there will be a great earthquake. Um, Zechariah, well, da Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 tells us that it's going to be a time of exceptional trouble, trouble such as never was. And in Zechariah chapter 14, it speaks of a, a tremendous earthquake. And we, we've seen the effects of earthquakes recently with the uh, events in Japan and the tsunami that followed absolutely terrifying events and that tsunami in Japan we're told is a, a one in a thousand year event but that kind of thing um, is most uncommon and we have seen with our own eyes the effects uh, of it as that tsunami swept uh, across the uh, Indian Ocean the Pacific Ocean uh, and the power that was released in that earthquake in Japan was equivalent to 31,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. Absolutely tremendous power is released in a, a major earthquake uh, as this particular one was. And we've had a number of serious earthquakes in the um, beginning of January 2010. There was the one in Haiti which uh, left a third of a million dead and a third of a million injured and a, a million homeless. Uh, and there's many of those are still homeless to this day. Um, on a much uh, lesser power, that was a, a, a level 7, 7.0. So the Japanese earthquake was a thousand times stronger. Um, we also had the Christchurch one, which uh, affected so many of our brothers and sisters uh, living out there. A much smaller earthquake again, but and, uh, the amount of damage was much smaller, but for a little uh, island like New Zealand, it was a very serious thing. Uh, and again, far less power than the um, Japanese one. But the, the Japanese one was a uh, Force 9. Um, because this is a logarithmic scale, that, that is uh, a tremendously powerful. It's the, the, the biggest earthquake that uh, Japan has experienced, and she experienced many earthquakes, is on an earthquake uh, zone. And in that, with the earthquake and the tsunami, uh, over a million homes were damaged and 15,000 were killed and 6,000 injured. As I say, within a few minutes, that tsunami just swept across, uh, sweeping inland waves uh, 40 metres high, 133 feet high, uh, going up to six miles inland, and sorry, um, shooting across the Pacific at the speed of an aeroplane, 500 miles an hour. Absolutely stunning. We've had uh, already this year eight earthquakes at a level seven plus. Though, to be completely fair, that is uh, quite a bit less than we've had in the past two years. Um, we seem to be just having a little lull, as so often happens with earthquakes. You, you build up and you have a series of big ones, and then it dies down again and you build up again. If we take earthquakes of a magnitude 5.5, where it does some serious damage at 5.5 and above, uh, and that's just a chart from 1981 to uh, last year. And we can see how the average line is certainly an upward uh, line there, indicating that we are in a period of increased activity, which is what we would expect with the knowledge that we have that uh, times of trouble lie ahead for this earth. So it's Zechariah chapter 14 which describes this great earthquake which will take place at the time of the return of the Lord Jesus. Uh, let's just read that verse. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west. And there shall be a very great valley. Half the mountains shall remove toward the north and half toward the south. And we know that Jerusalem is in an earthquake area. It's at the meeting point of the African plate and the Arabian plate. Um, those two plates are moving in opposite directions and therefore 
and giving rise to friction and uh, ultimate to earthquakes. And the uh, Jewish authorities recognise that uh, they are due for a big earthquake. And uh, what they're saying is that they aren't really uh, prepared for it. Uh, and they're talking that even if it was uh, a 7.5 earthquake, which is way, way less than, say, a Japanese earthquake at 9, um, it would be expected to cause 16,000 deaths uh, in Israel. So if somebody recognises their car alarm, <laughs> I had nothing to do with that. It was not an earthquake. <laughs> um, so if we look at the statistics, uh, there were major earthquakes in Israel, 31 BC, 363 AD, 749 AD, and 1033 AD. So you can see that we're long overdue having a major earthquake in that area. Now the interesting thing is that God has already built into the area the mechanism for the fulfilment of those words in Zechariah chapter 14. Because it, it speaks of the mountain being split east-west, and part of the mountain moving northwards and part moving southwards. This is the Mount of Olives region, though the, the bottom end is the, the main part of the Mount of Olives. Uh, this is Jerusalem with the Temple Mount and the valley um, between there. And we know that there is a, an east-west fault that runs across, if we just put the map on it, uh, that, that God has built in the fault line already, so that when there is this massive earthquake, then the mountain will indeed move uh, part north and part south, and the Mount of Olives, which appears so solid, will uh, be divided in two, and uh, eventually a temple will be built and the, a river will run down into the Dead Sea. But again, the Bible tells us of, of the great geographical changes that this earthquake will bring. Not only does it split a mountain, which implies it's going to be a, a major, major, major earthquake, but it also alters the whole topography of the ground. That's a cross-section uh, of the land of Israel today, with uh, Jerusalem perched on the, the top just about there. Uh, and then it plunges down into the Dead Sea, which is the lowest part on the, uh, on the Earth's surface. But the effect of the earthquake is going to change the whole topography um, of the region. Um, and uh, the Temple in Jerusalem will be on a level plain. And the Dead Sea, instead of being a Dead Sea, will be a living sea. Uh, and instead of waters flowing down the Jordan into the Dead Sea, the waters will flow from Jerusalem into the now living sea with fish in it, and the Jordan will be reversed uh, because uh, the Dead Sea will be uh, so elevated. Uh, and so tremendous changes that are uh, there. And Isaiah chapter 2 tells us that it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established and the top of the mountains shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. It's to become the centre of the earth uh, and the temple will become the centre for worship for the whole world. And so these changes are necessary for its future use. But Isaiah in an early chapter talks about the terrible time of, of this earthquake that they will go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he ariseth to shake terribly the earth and later in Isaiah he, he talks in similar language it shall come to pass that he that fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit and he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare for the windows from on high are open, and the foundations of the earth do shake. So that is a picture of uh, a terrible time to come, but out of it will come tremendous blessings 
when the kingdom is established and the Lord Jesus is king, men and women will recognize that there is a creator. They will sing praise to his name as they recognize that the wonders of his handiwork and the um, glories of the things that he has made. And so uh, that psalm that we read, in that day, kings of the earth and all the people, princes and all the judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He hath exalted the horn of his people, the nation of Israel, the praise of all his saints, all those who have followed the Lord Jesus and be raised from the dead and made immortal in that day. Even of the children of Israel, a people near unto him, praise ye the Lord. And so we do praise God for his wonderful creation. And we thank him for this uh, wonderful book, which is also his creation, which is equally wonderful as the world that he has made. Because within its pages, uh, we come to know God and his plan and purpose and can look forward with confidence to this day when Jesus is king and in the mercy of God we can be helpers with him in that day to bring about the great change to this earth in instructing people in God's ways. So thank you.